Hello everyone, this is Rudolf Barisic and this time I will focus on making a video as a response to another video that was posted by uh, a guy called Ryan Dawson who is a geopolitical theorist. Uh, in many ways he is favored by the alt-right and uh, especially in regards to the foreign policy analysis when it comes to Russia. And um, I'm going to post the, the link to the video so you can follow it and also my responses to it. So you can please check it out. Um, <clears throat> but basically the video was, was about if um, Putin is going against Israel because Putin has positioned his, himself as against this globalist new world order and um, he in, in that way many old writers view Putin as someone who is going against also this Zionist world order yeah uh, so <clears throat> for this show I am by myself Jeff is not joining me here and uh, let's say the arguments expressed in this video are wholeheartedly mine so if you like this I want you to hit the like button make sure to subscribe and also make sure to post comments underneath yes so <clears throat> if we take it back it, in, the, in, in the video Dawson says that Putin is totally independent that he is challenging the Israeli interest in the Middle East now I wrote to Dawson and said to him that I commented on one of his on this video and told him that it is a fact that many of the oligarchs are still of Jewish descent and they still have a large support within Russia and it is also a fact that Russia and Israel has have maintained very good relations despite Russia's involvement in Syria. And overall, if anyone tuning in here is new to this, <clears throat> you will notice that Jeff and I have discussed many times that Russia is not exactly a minor state mining its own interest rather it is a hidden empire and the question that will be focused in this video is this hidden empire a Zionist project in a new package or is Russia a, a great power that is going against this new world order or what might be called this Zionist control of the New World Order. <clears throat> now, if we look what um, the, the, the common conception among old writers, like many people within the old right, such as David Duke and so on, they, they, they tend to say that, well, after war, when the Soviet Union disintegrated and communism was replaced by nationalism, that Russia no longer is a communist power and that it has left its socialist past and embraced nationalism and that then so Russia according to the old writers is a country that is based on the principles of nationalism but, but also a country that that cherish traditional values as opposed to the the West that is let's say more liberal, democratic, and what they would define as uh, corrupt totally and controlled by Zionist interest which forces it to abandon its nationalistic path and become more cosmopolitan and multiracialism like Jeff and I have discussed in the previous videos. So we usually tend to see Russia as someone as a great power that might challenge this new world order and in in what what my take on this would be <clears throat> which is very important that 
even though if you criticize, let's say, the Western liberal tradition and especially this liberal centrist conception of spreading democracy worldwide, the universal conception of human rights, um, it's the alternative with Russia, I would say, is not better. I would say that Russia is a hidden empire and that it does embark on a Euro-Asian Asian and Asianism and that it strives to achieve regional hegemony and it goes along with the Chinese interest as well in order to outmaneuver the West, especially the United States and Europe. But the question in this video is that is Russia free from Zionist interest? And if we look at, let's say, according to relatively new statistics, 25% of the absolute richest billionaires are in fact of Jewish descent in contemporary Russia. And if we look at these, who are these individuals? You have individuals like Roman Abramovich, Mikhail Friedman, German Khan, Anatoly Godamach, uh, Valery Kogan, and this latest tycoon is also considered to be an ally of Putin. Now I'm gonna, if, if anyone wants to comment on this, I will put the link underneath in the description so you can check it out what I'm talking about. Um, but no doubt that there is still a Zionist influence within the Russian Federation. And if we just look at, for instance, the the leader of from the Liberal Democratic Party, the great nationalist leader Vladimir Chirinovsky, he is himself of Jewish descent as well, and and has only spoken very good about the state of Israel, and so on. So you have that component too. And also, I have mentioned this like. In a, in a previous discussion that I had, I, I had an interview with Mr. Christopher Bolin, who has written extensively on 9-11 and also on the war on terror. And when Bolin and I discussed, I told him that, that when I followed the presidential elections in Russia, nobody of the presidential candidates were keen on discussing Israeli involvement in, in let's say or let's let's say Israeli beforehand knowledge about 9/11 or that they have benefited from 9/11 or or that they are pushing the US to advance Israeli interest in the Middle East rather what they did they focused 100 percent on how to combat Western imperialism and and it was a traditional discourse based on anti-imperialism, typical um, foreign policy analysis based on Marxism-Leninism, nothing new under the sun, it was pretty much a repetition. Uh, so in that sense I would say that, that many old writers are deceived because this is not a fact. Now, this is one argument. The second argument is that Israel and Russia have maintained very good relations despite Russia's involvement in Syria and we have noticed they have very good cooperation when it comes to the tech companies they have a good exchange of information and they have never been in direct confrontation with each other even though they do support different sides in this particular conflict in, in Syria and we have also noticed that um, the United States, even though that there is a conflict of interest between the United States and uh, and Russia, still it's not uncommon for Moscow to to have good relations with Israel and and building up anti-American sentiments because the United States is 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 hindering Russia from from expanding its imperial ambitions. Now, if, if we look at also 
what the responses have been. For instance, when I commented on this and said that, <clears throat> that, there is, that, that, that there still is a Zionist component within Russian politics, I got very angry comments from people that say that it's not true that whenever someone utters criticism against Russian expansionism, you're automatically considered a shill for NATO. And f for anyone who has been following who, my shows, I have never argued for NATO expansionism on other states' expense. I don't see, let's say, Western liberalism taking on universalistic turns and shaping the global order how it wants at the expense of others. I'm totally against that. But I'm also against this Euro-Asianism that is promoted by the Putin government. Because we have noticed that, like say, say prominent figures within <coughs> national Bolshevism, such as Alexander Dugin, have laid out the argument that Russia must take a path and expand within its Euro-Asian hemisphere. It, it, and Dugin also has made it quite clear that Russia is not in any way Europe. It is a combination, let's say, within the intersection of Europe and Asia. And also that, that in order for Russia to become a great power with great preponderance, both militarily speaking and economically speaking, it must ally itself with China to outmaneuver the West and to seek the fall of Europe in order to, to divide the power with the Chinese and have control over Europe. And I just don't see this as, as optimal. Uh, I don't want to see even I'm critical of globalization, that does not mean that I automatically must favor Eurasianism based on Duganism. I think it's, it's, it's crazy to do so. So I think we should be very careful to, to take one side. Now, in the previous videos that I've had, I mentioned clearly why this has happened. Now, we notice that we still live under the era of the post-World War II legal framework, that is, that Germany should be contained as a political power and the great powers divide their power between each other and Germany is not included in this formula. So therefore you have this shaky international system with great powers competing with each other. So they don't want any rival reappearing on the surface and gain power so that that's the reason why Germany is still contained now if we look at also the, the common critique you get is that oh but Russia is encircled by let's say NATO countries and so on and it has a right to defend itself now that I agree I fully understand that because Russia, since the fall of the Soviet Union, it has become encircled and has lost uh, an amount of its sphere of interest. But what should be also understood in this sense is that in 2014, when, when Russia invaded Crimea, we noticed that Russia embarked on this expansionist, and expansionist path and was totally against Ukrainian self-determination. And also here I get this often that many people would say, oh, how can you say that? Because the Orange Revolution was engineered by Western powers. It was not an organic revolution and so on. And in this sense, I have to say that, okay, that might be the fact that it was fueled by Western powers. But I am not in support of Ukraine, Ukrainian liberals. I am in support of Ukrainian nationalists. They really want to distance themselves from Russia and that they want to prosper 
and not be dependent on Moscow and what Moscow dictates to them. So it's only natural for me to support Ukrainian liberation. And also if we are fair, if we look at the countries that have prospered quite well, where they have combated mass migration much better than Moscow and the West, well there you have it. You have it Poland, you have the Czech Republic, you have Slovakia, and you have also in one sense Croatia, and naturally you have Hungary. Those are the countries that have prospered quite well and they have distanced themselves away from Russia. But they are also very critical of this imposed multiculturalism by Western powers. So we need to also take this into consideration that it's not necessary to, let's say, either you support Russian expansionism or you focus on or you simply support Western globalization. It doesn't have to be that way. So it is possible to, to take a different path, and especially in regards to foreign policy. For instance, my take on this would be that we need a Eurocentric analysis on foreign policy, that we need to take into consideration what is best for Europe. And if you see what happened, like for instance, it is absolutely necessary that Germany must take on a greater political role in foreign affairs and not just be reduced to an economic guarantor that just takes care of the poorer countries in the EU peripheries and is totally constrained to become a political power and that needs to be changed. And I would say that both Russia and the Western powers are very critical of a German political power. Now, if we look more what we can say in about this, like for instance, this Ryan Dawson, he usually he he criticizes the U.S. Israeli the lobby group for instance he has done tremendous work on on elucidating how the largest lob the most powerful lobby in the world apac is able to influence us politicians to categorically support israel when it comes to the middle eastern affairs now i would not dispute that but i will i, I also like when jeff and i have discussed in many old writers, they usually tend to lean on this full-spectrum dominance thesis, which means basically that you identify the Zionist interests as an all-encompassing power controlling the entire scope of international relations. And if you just study, for instance, the U.S. intervention in the post-9-11 era, it was immediately point aimed towards Afghanistan and not towards Iran. And if you study Afghanistan was never any did not pose any threat against Israel or the Western powers. Rather we saw that the Russian had quite strong interest in Afghanistan. And it was very interesting that all of a sudden after the 9-11 the United States identified Al Qaeda Al Qaeda and and Afghanistan as the principal enemy and then afterwards they shifted focus to to Iraq and then we noticed what happened with with Libya and then with Syria and so on now I'm not disputing that there is an element of Israeli involvement in shaping US foreign policy now that is nobody can deny it but to simply shift focus to Russia and to see Russia as an independent power that, that, that combat Zionism is not true at all. Now, like I said, you have still these oligarchs of Jewish des descent in Russia and they have very good power. You notice it also with people like Vladimir Chirinovsky, who is very proud of his Jewish roots and who is a philo Semite. So, and what I also want to mention is like, in many senses, also many people have said, oh, well, the Western powers then impose sanctions on Russia and so on. So Russia is isolated 
but that is not the entire truth either because of course the western powers did impose sanctions on russia but those sanctions were not sufficient to stop russia from supporting the rebel insurgents in the, in the donbas region or to just invade crimea which was against the international law as well so 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 you see that there is a problem in that sense now but the other argument that i would like to make is that what many old writers tend to forget is also that that moscow is still a financial headquarter in russia and you have all those big financial companies that are situated in russia you have goldman sachs you have gp morgan you have blackrock international the largest fund fund management firm in the world and it has a large of investments in russia so russia is not totally isolated it is still very active in inviting foreign companies within its territory <clears throat> Now what I also would like to make, uh, uh, I will also say that many of these, let's say, oligarchs that are uh, situated in Russia, they also have dual citizenship and they have very good ties with, uh, with Israel. And this needs to be also taken into consideration that uh, there is a large pot in, in the 90s, and especially in the end of the 1980s, we saw a huge migration flow from Russian Jewish Jews emigrating to, to Israel. And what many people need to take into consideration that that the Russian Jews in Israel, they are the most vibrant and active uh, in the Jewish communities in Israel. And Putin has on many occasions... Uh, said that he will do everything he can to 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 protect them if anything would go wrong now and also what the old writers they tend to also say that the religious movement of Chabad the Lubavitch which is a very powerful uh, let's say uh, conservative Jewish Let's say movement that it has a stronghold on U.S. on U.S. politics because, for instance, many Chabad members they are often visiting the White House and they have a strong presence there. And many alt writers also say that Jared Kushner is uh, following the, the the tenets of of Chabad and so on. And of course, that, that is a fact too, but you cannot deny, you see this as well in Russia, Putin is also surrounded by many members of the Chabad, Lubavitch. So I would say that the same goes for, for Russia too. So we simply cannot just view this as, it's, it's simply the Western powers, the EU and the United States are controlled by Zionist interests, but Russia is totally free from from them and can do and and are striving what they can to challenge the structure. This is not true. So I would say that uh, please check out this video that uh, uh, that Ryan Dawson when he totally denies he just say, oh Putin kicked the oligarchs out of the country, so now Russia is free of of. Of Zionist uh, influence and do not believe this this is not true what we see is that this alternative form of expansionism that Russia has embarked on it fits well with the interest of the Zionists as well because they are able to to just to to gain to receive support both, both from the United States and from Russia too so they can play each side, so they can have the great powers going head to head with each other, and so they can just continue to 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 strive for regional hegemony, which is in which is a natural interest for the Israelis to 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 do so. And I don't mean to 
in this video I'm not going to focus that much on if it's a moral question if the Israelis are, are entitled to do so and so on it in many people would say that they break international law and in that sense my take on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that I'm quite neutral to it whenever the Israelis break international laws of course I react to it but I see it as a as a regional power that is threatened by 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 Iran especially in regards to the northern Israel of the Hezbollah insurgency and so on so I can understand them from that point of view but I believe like I mentioned that the framework of foreign policy that I am discussing is very Euro is, is is centered on European affairs and how to make Europe become a great continent again and not to focus that much on the Middle Eastern affairs or what is happening who is doing what and so on of course we need to have to, to, to just promote stability in the region so we don't have these flows of migration into Europe because it will bury us if this continues so of course we need to negotiate and have good relationship with each country because we don't want to have wars there but I would say what is essential for the Europeans it's to strengthen its borders and to just stop mass migration that is the number one priority and then we need to focus on also how we can avoid taking sides like for instance the US is doing that oh naturally we have to focus on Russia and so on it doesn't have to be that way we have to build Western Europe again of course open up for countries in the Eastern Hemisphere to, to join Europe and so on I have no problem with that and also I have no problem with Russia I think we have to normalize and have good relationship with Russia, Russia too and I believe that Russia will experience a path of liberalization like we have discussed in previously in this uh, in, in, in this podcast and so on but I want to for anyone tuning in here I want you to hear what I say and so on and so we can please make sure to comment and if you're new to this channel please hit the like button make sure to subscribe I will post as many videos as I can on this subject but I want us to, to, to have a good dialogue surrounding the subject because in this video I got some angry <laughs> comments and I try to reply to them and so on but I will post the link and I'll, and I'll let you check it out but I want to thank you so much for uh, taking time taking your time to listen to this and, and I will be back soon with another video take care now bye bye